Hi, I'm the History Guy, and if you didn't know, in addition to the YouTube channel, I also have a page over at Locals at the History Guy Guild. That locals.com where you get all sorts of exclusive content, including weekly live streams with your truly the history guy. And sometimes we're able to make special videos just for our supporters and locals. And for just five dollars a month, you can not just support the history guy, but get access to some of that special content, like this video that I made for our local supporters about a visit I made to a very special group of historical collectors. Locals people got to see this last March, and today I'm able to bring an extended version to you, the YouTube audience. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a supporter on Locals. Oh, so heavy. What do you think? Say hi. Last fall, my son Josh and I were given a special invitation to go visit with some hobbyists who are dedicated to preserving a specific bit of history. As you can tell by the hats behind me, I'm a bit of a collector myself, and I always love to meet with people whose passion for collecting intersects with my love of history, because of course, people who collect historical items are quite literally preserving history. And that's why I was so excited to go find some history that deserves to be remembered at the 42nd Annual Colt Collectors Association All Colt Gun Show, which was held just outside of Indianapolis in Noblesville, Indiana. The history of Samuel Colt and the various companies which have manufactured Colt firearms is broad and fascinating. Samuel Colt received his first British patent for an improved revolver all the way back in 1835. The website of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody, Wyoming, explains that Colt got the idea for his patent from a sailing ship. In 1830, at age 16, he landed a job as an apprentice seaman on the brig Corvo, became an experienced sailor after four months on sea. It is thought that during this time he created his revolving cylinder idea from watching the ship's wheel and seeing how it worked. Carved items like a six-shot cylinder and a hammer out of wood. These designs that he crafted were very different from guns of the time. These wood designs would later give Colt his success. He manufactured his first revolver using his design. He also received two patents in the U.S. in 1836. In 1837... In the factory was near Patterson, New Jersey, and the revolver he produced, described as the first repeating firearm using a revolving cylinder with multiple chambers aligned to a single stationary barrel, is popularly called the Colt Patterson Revolver. The revolver was originally a five-shot, 28 caliber revolver. Colt's patents essentially gave his company a monopoly on revolver development until 1850. The Colt Collectors Association is dedicated to the preservation of Colt firearms and other items produced by the company, along with the study of the history relating to their development and usage. One interesting part of Colt collecting is that many of the firearms can be tracked via the company's historical archive. We had the pleasure to speak with Colt historian Beverly Haynes, who has worked for Colt for more than 40 years. Although the group that does the research and provides archive letters has now spun off and is now its own entity, Colt Archive Properties, LLC. You can find them at coltarchives.com. Beverly explains that Colt archives go back to the 1860s, meaning that they do not have records for early models like the Colt Patterson revolvers. The lack of earlier records is largely, she explained, because many records were lost in a February 1862 fire at the Colt Armory in Hartford, Connecticut, although she noted that some records have been lost for reasons other than the fire. Much of the research demand goes back to the 1870s and the model 1873 Colt single-action army revolver that is popularly called the Peacemaker, which is not only popular with collectors, but the Colt manufacturing company's most embellished gun. While there are online tools for researching Colt firearms by serial number, Beverly and her team will, for a fee, research your firearm and provide a personal letter outlining all of the fine points of your firearm, written on the Colt Archive's distinctive stationery, embossed with the official seal and signature of the Colt historian. The researchers will provide information about the condition of the firearm when it was originally shipped, where it was shipped, to how many guns were in the shipment, and additional information like whether the gun was ever returned to the factory for for example, additional engraving. Beverly is a collector herself, and her unique position has allowed her to collect some very unique Colt firearms, for example, ones that have unique finishes that were rarely used on that particular model. Some firearms are recognized as having unique collector value, and those might be included in the President's Reserve, where the president of the Colt Manufacturing Company decides how they are distributed, going to friends of the company, valued customers, notable persons, or, Beverly explains, on rare occasions, to Colt Company employees on their 40th anniversary of working for the company. 
Virtually all of the collectors at the show have chosen to use the service and document the items in their collection with the archival letter. You really won't find more passionate collectors of anything anywhere, and they have uncovered some truly obscure history that deserves to be remembered. Tom collects cult firearms that were owned by Arizona Rangers, a niche for sure since the law enforcement organization only existed for around eight years, between 1901 and 1909, and only 107 men served. This cult belonged to Private Sam Hayhurst, the last Arizona Ranger to make an arrest in 1909. Russell's booth is next to Tom. He collects cults that have had special modifications made by the D.W. King Gunsight Company of San Francisco, California, including a tiny mirror at the front of the barrel making it easier to see the gun sight. American Handguns explains, D.W. King was a rifle marksman who was not satisfied with the sights generally available, so decided to make his own. This was in the late 1920s, and he formed the King Gunsight Company. King not only provided rifle sights, he did a brisk business applying custom sights to six guns, especially for target shooters. King was a premier maker of gunsight modifications between the First World War and the mid-1950s, but has now been closed for more than 65 years, making Colts with King Gunsight conversions collector's items. This display belonged to Dee Dee, who told us that she has been attending Colt shows with her father John since she was six years old. It's a passion that still brings them together, and their booths at the show were next to each other. Dee Dee says that they plan and coordinate their displays every year. And the collection that Dee Dee was showing this year represented a truly rare bit of Colt history, the Colt Burgess Rifle. Designed in 1883 by American Andrew Burgess, the patent for this lever-action rifle was sold to the Colt Company. Colt had specifically engaged Burgess to design a rifle to compete with the lever-action rifles of the Winchester Company. Colt Burgess rifles were all chambered for the popular 4440 caliber centerfire cartridge used by the United States Army and produced in a rifle version as well as a carbine and light carbine versions. The Colt Burgess was produced for a period of less than 21 months, between July 1883 and 1885. Dee Dee explains that when Winchester's saw Colt, known for producing handguns, was trying to move into the lever-action rifle market then dominated by Winchester, Winchester threatened to design a handgun to compete with Colt, and the two reached a gentleman's agreement to stay out of each other's space. Colt continued to make rifles, but moved to the Lightning, which used a pump rather than lever action. The short production period means that Colt Burgess rifles are exceptionally rare firearms. A total of only 6,403 Colt Burgess rifles were produced. But a collector can't stop there. For example, Dee Dee showed in her display a deluxe special order Light Burgess, one way to distinguish the carbine from the rifle is the ring on the side of the carbine used for a carrying strap. She explains that only about a thousand of the light Burgess carbines were produced. Only 2% of those were special order, and only five of the case hardened version in her display were made. And if you think that is rare, it isn't by any means the rarest in her display, which includes one of only two round barreled special order Colt Burgess rifles. The only one-half round and one-half octagon special order Colt Burgess rifle, and the only factory engraved Colt Burgess carbine ever manufactured. Another in her display was a special order rifle shipped to Colonel Jacob L. Green, who was George Custer's adjutant general during the Civil War and best man at Custer's wedding to Libby Baker in 1864. Dee Dee said that she collected her first Colt Burgess rifle about 25 years ago and kept collecting them because they just didn't make many of them. She's collected about 80 of the rare rifles, and each one of those is unique because, she says, she doesn't keep duplicates. Her father, John's display, featured another rare part of Colt history, the Colt conversion. Guns Magazine explains that what cartridge conversions represented was a change of concept from revolvers accepting loose powder and ball, or paper cartridges, rammed in from the front of the cylinder, to ones taking fully contained metallic cartridges loaded from the rear of the cylinder. The reasoning, the magazine explains, was that until 1869, Smith and Wesson controlled the patent on revolver chambers bored completely through. Therefore, Colt had to stand fast with their cap and ball revolvers or have nothing to sell at all. They could not join the metallic cartridge age until the patent expired. It did, and by 1871, Colt began selling these so-called conversions. Although the magazine explains the term conversion is a misnomer because it implies the genre of revolver was actually converted, that its revolvers were already built as cap and ball types and were converted to fire metallic cartridges. Colt conversions weren't built that way. They were assembled from a mix of parts left over from cap and ball revolver production and newly manufactured ones. 
In truth, it was a brilliant business move because it allowed the Colt Patent Firearms Company to convert literally tons of obsolete parts for revolvers, no longer in production, into cash. Conversions allowed Colt to sell metallic cartridge revolvers more cheaply than most competitors, although the process represented a unique period until supplies of parts from previous models, the most common was the Model 1860 Army 44, were exhausted. Like his daughter, John's display featured rare versions of an already rare class of Colt firearms, representing a transformational period for firearms. Another collector who preferred we not mention his name told us he had been collecting historic Colt firearms for 55 years and derived his passion from his father. His display this year represented another bit of nearly forgotten history, the time of the Cellar Club. This hobby was developed around a well-equipped 12-yard shooting range, literally in your cellar. The collection included Colt New Police Target and Police Positive Target revolvers manufactured between 1897 and 1941. Despite the name, these were not firearms made for police use, but rather light-caliber pistols designed around a similar frame. The marketing piece says that they were designed with a smaller frame in order to provide a target revolver for shooters who prefer a lightweight arm. In practice, if the pictures in the marketing materials are to be believed, that meant a pistol designed for a lady with a lighter frame and smaller handle to fit her hand. Using these pistols was, the brochure insists, a new source of beneficial outdoor recreation, and a clean, competitive sport that developed steadier nerves, a quicker, keener eye, and added self-reliance and confidence in an emergency. Most used 22 or 32 caliber ammunition, although they could be as large as 38. The collector explained that the hobby of shooting at your basement wall faded during the Depression when these pistols were considered luxury items, and more so after the Second World War when, he explains, lots of veterans had had enough and weren't interested in guns. Still, he's managed to collect a wide selection of the target pistols from the bygone Cellar Club era. The rarest are rather fancy for what was intended to be a simple pistol with utilitarian purpose. He proudly displays the only Colt Police Positive Target 22 caliber second model that was both factory engraved and gold-plated. I was left to wonder what the original owner's cellar must have looked like. To show the breadth of the hobby, the booth next door belonged to Jim, the other collector's literal next-door neighbor. Having retired, he was seeking a hobby, and inspired by his friend, he decided to create his own collection, although somewhat more modest in ambition. He collected a Colt catalog from 1952, the year of his birth, and then collected an example of every model Colt made that year. There were only 12 models in the catalog, but that meant collecting 14 guns, because, he said, two of those models came in two calibers. Robert prefers to collect Colt Model 1911s, a semi-automatic pistol. He explains that people who collect Colt revolvers are called wheel gunners by collectors, while collectors who prefer semi-automatic pistols are called bottom feeders. Robert specializes in the M1911 and 1911A1 because that was the sidearm that he used when he served in the Army as a military policeman. This one was sent to Company K of the U.S. 21st Infantry at Schofield Barracks in May of 1940, meaning that it was almost certainly present during the attack on Pearl Harbor 19 months later. Robert also showed us a Colt Ace, a unique model 1911 modified with a floating chamber recoil booster. The idea seems odd. You would not typically want to boost a firearm's recoil, but the floating chamber was a training pistol, which allowed the gun to kick like a 45 while firing 22 caliber ammunition. This allowed the Army to provide realistic weapons training without using more expensive combat ammunition. Ironically, the inventor of the floating chamber was a convicted murderer named David Marshall Williams. He applied his machine skills in the prison shop at the Caledonia State Prison Farm in North Carolina, where he eventually was put to use servicing the guard's weapons. His sentence was eventually commuted, and he went on to earn multiple patents for firearms, including four that were part of the design of the M1 carbine. He was even the subject of a biographical movie called Carbine Williams, and was played by Jimmy Stewart. Sam, in the booth across from Robert, maintains his own website at coltautos.com, which provides numerous resources for Colt collectors. Notable in the research are details about Colt presentation pistols to U.S. Army general officers. Colt 1903-32 and Colt 1908-380 automatic pistols were issued to general officers from 1944 to 1972, with an estimated 1,400 issued over the period. Sam has collected several of these pistols, and his webpage contains a wealth of information on the pistols and the officers who own them. 
This was really just a few of the great people that we got to meet at the 42nd Annual Colt Collectors Association, all Colt Gun Show. A truly gracious group of people who are passionate about their collecting. Heck, they even gave me this great set of Colt cufflinks, and thank you for those. And I would say that really I've just barely, shall we say, etched the surface of the things that we saw at the show. We might feature more people and things that we saw there in future episodes. Colt firearms really were at the center of an awful lot of United States history. As their marketing slogan goes, God created all men, but Samuel Colt made them equal. And the Colt Collectors Association is dedicated to preserving that history that deserves to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you have to do is subscribe.